Welcome to the MuseCast, where we squeeze every last drop of inspiration out of Sunday's sermon. Oh, there they are. <laughs> I love it. I, I, you haven't done that in a while, Dan. You ha- So I feel like the MuseCast has been lacking and now all is yeah. well. All yeah. is well. I got the finger guns. We're ready to go. Happy Tuesday, everyone. Welcome to the MuseCast. He's Dan Kent. I'm Shauna Boren, and we are here to continue the conversation from Sunday's sermon in which the good doctor Gregory Boyd was back in the house, um, exceeded, I'm going to say, my expectations, because I honestly did not think that he'd be back in a week, like he said. We we had some preparations in place just in case recovery took a little longer, but he is, he's looking good. He's looking yeah. good. Um, how are, are you feeling today, Dan, in this brisk fall morning that we're having? Yeah, yeah well, um, it's uh, I'm in denial and I'm kind of floating through the I mean, we're I mean, we're just barely it's not even bad yet. Like if I, I keep telling Barbara this, you know, like if this was March right now, we would be giddy about how great it is. But uh, yeah, it's <laughs> every year. It's the same slow descent into cold madness. So, yeah. 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 I, so about this time of year, um, when my kids are like, oh, it's a little chilly out. Oh, what do I wear or whatever? And then, then I start to hear people complaining a little bit about it getting cooler I understand it, but I also say you were the same folks complaining just a couple of months ago (laughs) that it was too hot. So I'm going to need you to make up your mind. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to need you to make up your mind. Yeah. You know, here's what it is too. And it's not just about the, you know, how hot or cold it is. Um, it really is the air uh, yes. for me, like because like yes. we're we're almost at the point now where you can't touch a- any doorknobs without getting a shock because because what happens and people might not know this who are not in Minnesota, but when it gets cold, the air gets bone dry, and so uh, you know the you get a shock every time you touch something. You uh, your nasal system dries up, and that's why like if you you know you you go to sleep and you get that whistling sound when you snore, and just you know I mean it's just there are so many things, and you wake up and it's like you you feel like your mouth is you know a. a children's sand pit i mean it's just this <laughs> and you need uh you need water and and so yeah it, it's that it's all of that stuff that really uh ties together the 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 horror of winter that i just uh i, I maybe i'm just getting old but I, I i it's harder for me to endure than it was when i was younger so i'm getting soft I, that's the problem I, well no it's it's just the reality that is facing up to yeah. you now and that is a okay. Um, <laughs> I'm laughing at your very descriptive sleep patterns, and I'm going to be <laughs> praying for Barb because apparently yeah. You, yeah. you you snore like you got a whistle yeah, <laughs> embedded in you, and well, and you know you try to breathe through your nose because that's healthier and all of that, but then you get the whistle factor, and uh, yeah. you know it happens. It, it happens. Does. It does. How are you handling the winter? You know, I, okay, it's not winter, sir. Calm down. This is fall. <laughs> it is brisk. It's lovely. You can have the windows open um, yeah. in the nighttime. And then I go in to wake up my daughter and she's like totally bounded and covers <laughs> all around her head. So I'm concerned about See- her being yeah. alive <laughs> yeah her and i we're we're kindred spirits because we so. both know it's over it's over yeah you yeah, might as well true. bundle up now because it's done <laughs> do it now because winter is coming um you know i have this cute little decoration out on the front porch um whose name is blanche and blanche is a I'm just going to say it's a, it's a cute little gold skeleton that sits in a rocker and has a little scarf on and a little hat, but the hat yeah. keeps blowing off. And so I'm a little annoyed that Blanche isn't keeping her accessories off. So I'm, <laughs> I'm going to need her to settle down. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. So I, mm. I'm dealing. I'm dealing. I, I enjoy it. I think the colors are pretty and I just am in denial as to what's around the corner. I'm yeah. just happily in denial. Yeah. Well, you know, what I say is that you just move into uh, a, the fall and you 
kind of, you know, you, you get busy working and then all of a sudden spring comes around. And so you try to, uh, to your, the best of your ability, make everything pumpkin spice flavored, and then you just get through it. That's the, <laughs> that's the goal. So. That's the guy who will be in Florida in no time flat. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. um, one thing from this weekend, Dan, that I realized is I need to update my last will and testament so okay. that my great, great grandchildren will know to tune into Woodland Hills for, let's just say chapter 12 of Revelation, yeah, because yeah, I really. think... That's where we'll be at that time. So I want them to know that something yeah. good is coming. <laughs> Tune in. And so I'm yeah. just gonna I'm gonna write that into my will so my great great grandchildren can get it on this goodness That's of this right. series. That's right. Yeah, it might be that long because it uh <laughs> I mean, Greg, you know, he I, I, he, you just get this vibe from him like okay he's really feeling stuff here and um mm -hmm. and so it, it it might go a while i i still hold that once we get into the seven churches we're gonna start chunking three four five ten verses at a time and so it Ooh. won't be that long but boy i tell you what i i, I have a i have a suspicious <laughs> feeling this could go a while so Verse three, woo, for the long haul. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, right. hey. Well, give us a summary. Let's because do it. It's, it's, Greg well, loved your sermon so much that he yeah. just re-preached it. Yeah, well, and that that was that was really he he said some nice things. I appreciated that. Uh, but I, I agree with him. I, I think that this idea, this this Tereo, I think is really important. And I love the direction that he took it. And uh, but it was interesting because uh, his sermon, and this is what I told him on Saturday. I'm like, you know, dude, you're killing me here. How do I do a sermonry on this? I mean, that's just it's not even really like a three point sermon. It's like this fireside chat, you know which is much more enjoyable to listen to. And, and cause it just feels like, Hey, you're having a chat with, with Greg, but it's uh, it's really hard to do a sermon on cause he just, he covered so many things. And so I guess what I would say is uh, I, there's probably a lot to discuss here. So the discussion portion of this could be really fun, but as a sermon, I'll just kind of highlight what I think is sort of the heart of what he's saying. Uh, but just as an example of just the fireside chat nature of this, he just he 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 comes out and just drops this uh just nugget like right away. He's just talking about how, you know, look, we're we're gonna talk about uh Tereo again for the second week in a row. And he just talked about how we have to resist this lure of Babylon, which is that every sermon has to be fresh and new and entertaining, and and sometimes you have to saturate. And, and that's not even the point of the sermon. He hasn't even gotten to the sermon yet, and and he drops that gem. And and I just think that that's 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 really important to hear in our culture, in our meme uh, kind of, you know, clout driven culture where everybody is looking for attention. Uh, the more you're looking for attention, the more important it is to be entertaining and new and fresh. And, and, and you can get a lot out at that level, but man, the real gold is at a deeper, more saturated level. And, uh, and, and I think starting with that is just a, a really uh, good point. But I think what I would say is um, if I were to summarize the point of Greg's uh, fireside chat, I, I really do think that he he's looking at this idea of um, uh, he, he says that, you know, we, we're, we live in this spiritual warfare and the enemy is trying to kill our witness and they can do, the enemy can do that in one of two ways. He can either kill the, the witness themselves, that is martyr them. Or he can kill their witness, that is, mess up the message that they are sending or mess up their ambassadorship. And and uh, and the way that uh, the, the serpent or the enemy or the principalities and powers, the way that they most often do that is they water down the message. And I, I think what that what that means for Tereo is that like he's. Greg said that we're we're supposed to be lamps on a lampstand and shining to the world, and the enemy is trying to kill that witness, is trying to dim that light, and you do that by um, having the light accommodate with other lights, with artificial light, with the light of the world, with uh, uh, with uh, the just the, the the false light of the world, I should say, and um, in other words, it waters down what we're saying. We we. Um, we compromise our word. We compromise our message for uh, something that the enemy wants us to embrace and uh, 
And that's kind of how it waters up. So tereo means to fight against that temptation to water down our beliefs and to uh, to fight against the temptation to compromise. And so there's it's important for us to maintain the high standard that Jesus sets for us and and to uh, to actually live with these kind of um, hearts for what God is teaching, uh, which is this, this perfect witness. And, um, and Greg just makes the, the point where it's not enough to learn about those things. It what's important is living it out. And that's the hard part. The hard part is actually living it out. And so here's the, here's the, the trap. And I think Greg is doing a great job of kind of, uh, uh addressing both dangers. One danger is, uh, to, um, live into grace uh, and to just say, you know, let go, let God, and to not worry about the standard that God has set for us. Um, and, and, and that's where we're going to start compromising and just living just like everybody else in the world. The other temptation is to say, no, we are going to embrace the standard. We're going to embrace uh, the teaching that Jesus has for us. And, uh, and to do that in this extreme sort of way where we become judgmental and harsh toward everybody who fails to meet that standard. And that's a mistake also. And so uh, the goal is, I think, to continue to maintain the high standard, but to do so with grace. And that's where, you know, Greg is talking about the disciples, how, look, uh, what's so beautiful about having these disciples is that they were such screw ups and, and uh, they were so imperfect and, and yet they, they still maintain that high standard. And, and you don't know that you're screw ups unless you maintain that high standard. And so that's sort of the, uh, the kind of goal I think is to continue to pursue the high standard of that perfect love that God is calling us into. Uh, and, and what that means is um, it means committing to it. It means setting your heart toward that. It doesn't necessarily mean that tomorrow you're going to wake up and from <laughs> you know, I got to do my tomorrow, you're going to wake up and, and do and be perfect for the rest of your life. It just means that uh, that's what you're committed to. And, and you're hopefully getting better and better and better at that. And, uh, and, and that happens definitely within community. And uh, because, you know, part of having the watered down message is that we get deceived by things and it's really hard to uh, detect our, the deception in ourselves. And so it helps to have other people in our lives to help us with that. And then Greg just ended with a, a kind of a, a covenant vow that he invited people to consider making. And that is to uh, commit to, to Reo in to commit to uh, God's standard uh, together. And um, uh, yeah. And, and, and I, I and I yeah the, the the fireside chat nature of this just the point about uh, covenant really is a structure for Tereo. It, it's articulating our Tereo. It's articulating what we're keeping and protecting. And and so I, it's so great that uh, covenant is such an important part of that. I think there's just a ton more in here, but I think that is sort of the heart of what Greg was doing the way that I could see it. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot there, but what, what did you think of uh, Greg's first sermon back from back surgery? Woo. First sermon back. I will say, first of all, it was so great just to see everyone excited that he was there really in celebrating his presence. That was really cool. Cause everyone, we've all been praying for him and it's just cool to just, just for him to, to feel that. So, um, and totally. honestly, I'm so, I'm so happy that his recovery is going so well and he seems to be abiding by doctor's orders and taking care of things. That's the, the way big he's thing. To. <laughs> That's the big I question know. mark. <laughs> I know. I know. Are you going to do what you're told to do and not do what you're told not to do? That's the thing. So that's the prayer moving forward so far. So good. I really did enjoy the fireside chat. I know that I made a joke about, you know, my great, great grandchildren, uh, you know, <laughs> being the the benefactors of uh, the completion of this series or they're, you know, they're in somewhere, but um, I did really enjoy it. And I do think it's important when you sense the spirit saying, hey, don't move on too quickly, because you're right, we have the attention span of a gnat and we <laughs> right. like to just move on to the next thing. I'm telling you, like when I, 
if, if I'm scrolling on social media and like say I'm on TikTok and someone's taking too long to get to what it is they're trying to show me, I'm done. I'm, I've moved on. Yeah. Like if you don't capture me in the first 10 seconds, I'm over it. So I do think this is a good practice. Um, not because just to do it for the sake of doing the practice. But I do think if we sense the spirit saying, hey, dig in, linger here for a bit. Let's let's see what else there is that we need to see here. I think it's important to do that. And it does fight against um, our current culture in that we are so very like busy in our minds and ready for the next thing. So I know I was joking, but I do think it's a good thing. And remember last week we talked about Lectio Divina. And so... <laughs> We are literally doing that in a sense as an entire community. Um, so I think it's great. I think he expounded yeah. upon some of um, your points really well. Um, I I appreciated just the further explanation of Toreo. And I think he even brought out um, territory uh, yeah. about defending a territory. So that kind of made me think through um, the language a little differently, uh, yeah. just in a different way. So I thought that was really, really helpful. Um, again, I think we're seeing the importance, like the covenant language used there, what I think you and I are going to dive into a bit. And yeah. I love, it's like, it's as if he listened to our MuseCast conversation <laughs> last week, because he really brought in the community aspect of it. Um, mm. in, in that this is something that we are doing together and for one another and not something that we're doing on on our own you can't defend a territory on your own um you wouldn't be very successful so yeah um, a lot of good stuff i have a feeling we'll have more opportunity to discuss a little further um in the weeks to come mm. i think you did a great job with your summary though and hitting those high points um good. I have a couple of questions. So I'm going to kind of say to you, I have some questions about, you know, this deception that we were warning about not being co-opted co by Babylon that we uh, talked about a little bit, um, culture stuff and not just going along with culture. So I have some questions in that vein, but I also think we need to talk about covenant and just that language that's used in our most common form of covenant that we know today is, is the marriage covenant. And so we have a couple of different directions we can go in, but I would like for you to uh, choose your own adventure. Oh, um, well, I, there was definitely one thing I wanted to talk about. Uh, I think partly because in my sermon the week before uh, I had talked about the lamb and yeah. why, oh, why yeah, the yeah. lamb is used. And I tell you what, I, I got a lot of, uh, you know, people just reaching out saying, oh, hey, thanks. I, I always wonder, we keep talking about the lamb and we never talk about why we're talking about a lamb. And and I think the lamb is Jesus, but I didn't really know why. They, why not just say Jesus? And and so, you know, so people were really, really appreciated just that little short explanation that I gave. And and I think as we're going through Revelation, we're going to need, we're going to have a lot of things like that. It's like, what the heck is that? And, yeah. uh, and th this week, Greg mentioned uh, Jesus as the bridegroom. And, and I remember when I was a new believer, like, you know, it's just weird talking about Jesus as the bridegroom. First of all, we don't like use bridegroom in our language. We use, you know, fiance, we use uh, the bride, we use the groom, but bridegroom, we don't, we don't just don't use that language. So, um, and so I just want to talk a little bit about that. And, and it's interesting because uh, the language basically is is based on this idea that Jesus is the uh, the groom, he and the church is the bride, and our relationship with God is sort of like this marriage relationship, and that's sort of the foundation of this language. And Jesus is the one that the church is marrying, and uh, and so it, it really kind of captures the 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 uh, the intimacy of our relationship with God. Now, uh, it, what's fascinating is that the bridegroom and bride language is used in the Gospels, and it's referred to here and there by the Apostle Paul, but it really comes raging back again in Revelation. Uh, and I think that there's a, 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 some fascinating uh, reasons for that. And so just really briefly, though, first, I just want to make it clear that the reason why this language is used is not because um, – 
uh, you know, we can't understand God unless we're in marriage, you know, or unless we're married. That's not the point of it. Uh, the, the the point is, is that marriage represents the closest thing to the covenant structure that God has created for the church and uh, God. And so that, uh, you know, because a, a marriage is actually a covenant between two people and it's a, it's a very intimate relationship. And there's love involved there. There's self-sacrifice. There's other orientedness and all of that. But also this marriage covenant really captures the nature of our current, uh, this current state of our relationship with God, where there is a type of absence between uh, us. And, uh, and that really resonates with kind of ancient marriage ceremonies where um, the, the, the groom would come and, be betrothed to the bride and then would go away for a year or sometimes even longer. And usually uh, the groom would establish an estate or build a house or something like that during that time to prepare for the bride. And then in the meantime, the bride would prepare for uh, the groom. And so the, the, the the marriage language in the New Testament captures all of that as well. And so now as we come to Revelation, we're coming to that point where the groom is coming for the bride. And, and so that's why this language is used because it really, it captures all of that stuff. And so the Apostle Paul taps into this language, like in 2 Corinthians I think it's chapter 11. Uh, I think it's 11, uh, right at the beginning, where he talks about uh, he his lament or his concern for the Corinthians is that they're not taking their preparations seriously enough for Christ's return. Are you making yourself a presentable bride for this groom who has given so much? And and it's used as sort of a motivation to uh, to really talk about what Revelation is talking about, and that is to keep yourself pure from the influence of uh, the the serpent, from the principalities and powers, from Babylon, from all of these dark forces, and to keep your witness pure for that. And so that's that's why that language is used, and we're going to come back to that language again and again. And so I thought it would be helpful to share just a little background on that. Yeah, thank you, Dan, because I think you're right. We, in our modern time, we can kind of lose some of the um, the gravitas of, of what's being said there because it's not necessarily our experience. And let's be real, like covenant, even marriage covenants or, or just aren't something that seem, for, for, for a variety of reasons, they just don't seem to um, hold importance for a lot of right. folks. Um, yeah. and part of it's because they don't understand it, but part of it is just because we, we just have a, anyway, we're not going to get into all of that. Yeah. Well, I think hey, it is important. Yeah. Well, and to that point, I mean, part of it is you have like, uh, you know, the divorce rates and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and really, you know, uh, well, but, but what's fascinating though, is that when you see people getting married, there's still this profound sense of joy at at weddings and and i think that taps into this um this hope for the reality or this hope that love might actually be this fulfilling this hope that love might actually there might be something real to that and and so no matter what happens in the culture there's still something in our hearts that uh gravitate toward this type of covenant and um and so yeah i i think that's why this marriage language even though we've wrecked marriage in this culture uh (laughs) there's still something in our hearts like 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 greg said we still intend for that we still want that and um whether even though we're far away from it so yeah well quick rabbit trail i have a story (laughs) I have a story about this very thing. Um, When I was about, I want to say maybe 22, one of my good friends was getting married and I was a bridesmaid. And so I went to travel to Louisiana to be in her wedding and it was beautiful. And we were so excited for her and her husband to be, and it was glorious. But, you know, and so I don't know if y'all do this up here, but in some ceremonies, they will say, you know, is anyone... Um, not that does anyone object, but it's like the, the, the preacher says to the bridal party and then to the family, like, do you understand that as witnesses to this union, you are, you are committing to support them and to be there for them and to encourage them and to help them. And we're like, yes, we, we understand. And he's like, so if you, if there's any concerns or any objections, like we need to say that now. And, 
and, you know, deal with that stuff now. And we're like, we're good. And he's like, any concerns, <laughs> any objections? We, I mean, like three times. And I'm wow. like, dude, just get on with wow. it already. Like what in the world? <laughs> it was the strangest thing. Um, yeah. He Maybe really he knew was... something that you all didn't know. I mean, that's, I, that's I, possible. I think he did. I think he did. Cause I'm just going to say, yeah, I'm just going to say not have happily ever after on that one. Oh, no. <laughs> so <laughs> he did know something, <laughs> but it was the strangest <laughs> thing. Hmm. Anyway. Thank you for your explanation of, you know, the bride and the bridegroom and, and covenant and how that fits. And I do think it's important when we're, we, we hear some of this language or some of this imagery that we do explain it. Um, Greg was going to kind of delve in a little bit more to the, the lamb of Jesus, uh, but that's, you know, too calm, too calm. So yeah. anytime that we can, in this conversation, help, you know, dissect some of that, I think it'd be helpful for our yeah audience. So thank you for doing that, Dan. Um, I would love to talk a little bit about, oh, deception. Um, just some of the warnings of not being co-opted, um, by the empire, by Babylon going along with culture. And this is, this is my main thing. I did ask this in our, we talked about this a little bit in our pastor's meeting, but um, cause I do have the question of like, man, like, how do you know, like, like Greg said, if you're deceived, you don't know you're deceived. That's the importance of community and having people around you. They can say, Hey, um, something's going on here. If you're a frog in that water, you're just chilling thinking this is, this is a great time. And, and yeah. then you're boiling. So there is that, but also, um, I, I, I just kind of am wondering, how we can know the difference between um, being countercultural because something's not right and just resisting progress and change. Yeah. So, for example, I want to, I hate just saying don't go along with the culture because I'm going to say that there have been times that the culture has actually been more right. Like they've been right. more, you know, like if you think of, the treatment of minorities, the treatment of women, I could go down right. the list, you know, there have been things in which the culture is like, hey, this is, we need to kind of, and, and sometimes the church has been the ones to kind of drag their feet. And so I don't yeah. want to just blanket it and say, don't go with culture or, oh, you're going, but how do you know the difference? Like, right. and I just think that's some very real um, boots on the ground in the trenches stuff that folks are dealing with. And I'm hoping that you can help us kind of swim through that water a little bit. Yeah. Well, that, that basically, <laughs> uh, it, it, what's implicit in that question is how do you know what's right? Uh, and, and that's, that's the whole game. That's the whole show. Right. And uh, so, uh, if I had that answer, I would not be doing the muse cast. I would probably, <laughs> you know, be someplace else. You know what though, Shauna, I would still be doing the muse cast cause this is too much fun. So I was going to say, you can't abandon me because you got <laughs> yeah. all the answers, I'll man. I'll take you with. I'll take you with. Let's <laughs> okay, go. Good, Let's go. Good deal. <laughs> no, hey, uh, I, I think it's, uh, it is, it's the heart of everything, that question. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a few things to say. I mean, first of all, there's two questions. There's there's the culture question, and then there is how do you know if you're deceived, de deceived personally? Um, and I want to, I'll do that one first. The, 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 okay. the personal deception, what I, I can't answer that. Cause you never, you, you know, it's, it's kind of unfalsifiable until it's too late. Um, but here's what I would say. That's been really helpful for me to at least think about my own life. And it goes back to a sermon I did, I think in 2020, 2021 called dashboard discipleship. And I just talked about how, you know, a lot of the things that you read in the scripture, you know, we tend to look at like, when Jesus gives us a command, like turn the other cheek and do not lust and, you know, things like that. And we tend to view that as like critical toward ourselves, like, well, gosh, I suck at that or whatever. And what I would encourage us to do as we're reading through this is to use those things, not as self-incriminating, but as indicator lights of where we're at. And so if, for instance, we are lusting. Well, that's an indicator light that we're not yet where we, sh we should be. And there's probably deception someplace. And that's where that's an indicator. Like I need to look for where am I being deceived? What's, what am I wrong about? What am I, what am I embracing? That's not true. Another example with uh, the bridegroom language, even, uh, you know, we're told that uh, 
John the Baptist delighted in the voice of the bridegroom and uh and and in other places where there's this delight at the presence or the voice of the bridegroom and this idea that when jesus comes back there will be this great joy and um and so that's another indicator light would you really feel joy if jesus came back and ended the whole show if it just this all of the the systems of the world were no longer valid or whatever would that bring you joy and i would suppose that a lot of people if they were honest they would be like no i kind of like the little life that i've developed right now and and that's an indicator light that you're being duped by that you're being deceived that you're putting way too much stock you're putting way too much value in these earthly things and so i like viewing like looking at the scripture and asking myself how do i relate to this teaching uh and if if i'm not relating the way that the scripture suggests i should that's an indicator that there's some deception in me that needs to be uh ferreted out and the response to that uh i think is to get good at confession and um and so I, and that, that, that was the second sermon in, in that I did. The first one was the dashboard discipleship. And then the next one was on confession. And John says that, uh, through confessing my sins, I am healed. And David says the same thing in the old Testament. It's like, when you get good at confession, you get good at ferreting out the deception in your heart. And, and so I would refer to that regarding the, the culture, um, that is a, a harder question uh, because you, you know, the culture wants to water down your witness, but sometimes your witness has already been watered down, and the culture is there to show you that it's been watered down, and and that's where I think you have to discern that in community, and uh, and sometimes you just have to face some hard lessons, you have to face some harsh realities, um, and I, I guess what I would say to that is, is something that I've been thinking about is that. You know, so many of these issues um, are meant to be are meant to be wrestled out in your community, but instead we've broadcast these issues on this this level that's outside of our community, and so things like even something like abortion. Um, you know, what is your stance on abortion? Like this worldwide stance on abortion. Uh, you know, like as if abortion was this thing out there that I am to orient myself to, but it's, it, it's never a thing out there. It's always something that happens in, uh, in, in an individual's life. And so that question I think has to revolve around that individual and their loved ones and their community and, and their community definitely has a responsibility to them to make sure that they are, 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 um, are being like moral and godly and all of that. But at the same time, the community has a responsibility to offer mercy and grace. Uh, and so, you know, holding that high standard with grace and mercy, it, that, that all comes into play on an individual relational level, not at a national, international broadcast level. That's not where these things should, because there's no mercy or grace at that level out there. Uh, mercy and grace is an important part of everything. And that happens in relationship. And so, you know, people will talk about like, you know, what is your stance on X, Y, or Z? And I'll say, well, who's experiencing that? Like, do I know them? Do I know their situation? Do I know all of the details? Mm -hmm. And And so that's kind of where I'm at with that is like, you know, are we are we wrestling with these things at the right level? Because some of these things should be wrestled with uh, at the individual relationship level. Anyway, that's a, a lot of talking. But what what are your thoughts on that? Because if you have an answer to that, man, that's I, that that would that'd be nice. Well, buckle up because I have all the answers. Yes. All right. <laughs> yes. I knew it. I knew it's, it. it's, that's just not true. <laughs> that's you know, you know what? Um, so something you said actually has been kind of in my the forefront of my brain as we talk about this, both the personal aspect of um deception and the more communal, global, worldly aspect of it. And that is that you said, and I'm just gonna paraphrase, you always assume that you're in some way being deceived or that you're wrong. You, you always just come from the posture yeah. of I'm probably wrong. And so as funny as just that statement is, it actually is something that stuck with me because it's like, man, if I 
always enter into a situation or a conversation or a way of living, assuming that I'm right, that I have all the answers, that I can't learn anything, that I couldn't yeah. possibly be wrong, then I'm already like out of the game. Like I yeah. need to have that posture of this is what I think. This is what I feel. I could be wrong though. And I'm open to hearing um, other perspectives. Now I have to say there are certain things that you just know, right? And I'm not saying be persuaded by something that you absolutely know, you know, is, is wrong, you know, beat this person up because, you know, they looked at you <laughs> sideways. Like, no, like don't let someone talk you in. That's not what I'm saying. So hopefully you guys understand that. I do think though, again, it comes back to heart posture. Like, do you have the posture of this is what I feel and think these are the reasons why I feel and think this, but I could, I could be seeing this wrongly. And I think that's, that's just a part of it. I think that's helpful. Um, and then I think as far as the more, like, like you said, the more out loud worldwide stuff, I think you're right. Mercy and grace that has like, love has to be the law. Not that we just allow anything to happen right. that is harmful to others, but I think a lot of our issues, and I'm just going to speak to believers, Christians, I think that you have folks that are so siloed into their own thoughts and they're just echoing one another's thoughts. And yes, we're right. And they over there are wrong. And we have to fight for what's right against them who are wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think once we're like pointing the daggers at people, then we, again, we're out of the game because we have to remember it's, uh, it's powers and principalities and, and, yeah. and it's never people. And it may be people saying stuff, but, but people are, are deceived. People are influenced and we have to remember that. And I think we have greatly lost our witness because we are, we are fighting just as much, if not worse yeah. <laughs> than everyone else. Totally. And so I think we have to uh, let love be our guide and mercy and grace. And I love the question, who is experiencing that? Like, don't let someone bait you into, you know, a debate about something. What do you think about, you know, global warming? What do you think about the border crisis? Like, don't. <laughs> yeah. Right. Let's make it personal, like bring in that proximity. Who is experiencing that? And, and, and why are you asking? Like, what's 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 yeah. your experience of it? So we can't solve it all in this conversation. But I think those are just some key principles that are helpful. Yeah. And again, I will just say whether it's it, um, on an individual level or a more global level, you need people because you won't know it all. You just won't. You won't know when you're being deceived. You won't know when you're going astray. You won't know if you're on the right path, if you're doing it all by yourself. And so we yeah. absolutely need people. And then the final thing I will say is, is don't let us think um, that as a community, we are going to um, it, the way we function within a community is different than the way I'll just say governments function. And so mm -hmm. there's that's above our pay grade. And I just I can't get into that. All I can do is influence what's around me and where God's called me to. And so I think we do have to kind of separate some of those. So that's a lot of my ramblings about. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's things. good. And I think that, uh, you know, like, don't tell me if a person is a pro-life Republican uh, that I want to hear about you know, Margo and Todd, that's who I yeah. want to hear about. Uh, you know, the, yeah. the, we use labels instead of names because we've lost the most precious thing, which is a relationship with the person. Mm -hmm. And and I, I just think that that's, I think that's going to, I think that the, that kind of uh depersonalization and the fact is, is that as, 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 as great as our modern technologies have been and as great as our uh civilization and our progress has been we have destroyed something that is more valuable than anything that we've created and that is the ability to just have good quality relationships with our neighbor and and even even people who are you know talking about like the uh the immigration crisis and and throwing these Bible verses about being good to our neighbor all over the place, they themselves are terrible at being good neighbors because they, instead of having relationships with people who disagree, they are just attacking people who disagree, ironically, with verses about being a good neighbor. And it's just, the whole thing is is an embarrassment. And yeah. and I think the answer is returning to relationship. And um, But it's 
we're a long ways from that. And, mm -hmm. and I think we start, you know, locally we, and, and that's what the book of revelation is, is doing. This is, and I'm kind of teasing what's coming, but the book of revelation talks about these global cosmic, uh, things, you know, but it starts off with a, a comment to these local communities. So as big and as global as it is, it starts with the church that you're in right now. That's where it starts. And that's where that's the foundation of it all. All of this grandiose stuff about, you know, the the warfare at the cosmic level and all of that doesn't mean anything if the local community fails to have loving relationships. And right now we're failing to have that because we're instead trying to do something at this cosmic international grandiose transcended level. And, uh, and that's, we will lose at that. Uh, the only chance that we have to win is when we get back in the trenches and we uh, have relationships with with real people, with Todds and Margos, not with Republicans and Democrats and pro lifers or whatever. And and and, and I, I, that's why I think that this series is so important right now. But. Mm, good stuff, Dan. I kind of feel like you were slipping in a nugget time there. So I'm going to need you yeah. to know, hold back for a moment yeah. because now, now is nugget time. So oh. do your nugget time dance yeah. because this is when we put a bow on the conversation <laughs> and leave these good folks with something to yeah. chew on, to simmer with um, until next week. So um, I'm going to let you, are you, are you kind of looking there? Yeah, I have no idea what I'm going to say yet. So yeah, me either. So let's just go. Okay. With it. All right. All right. Good. So okay. So just in continuation of what we've been saying, I think that this um, series is going to be so good for so many reasons. And right now, as we are hovering over this passage about hearing and keeping, and the challenge was to fight against the temptation to have our witness be watered down. Um, and to know what it is that we're defending, uh, you know, the territory that we are called to, I think it's important to remember that typically our fight, like I just said, isn't against someone else. It's not against another person. And one of the ways in which our witness gets watered down is when we're acting in ways that are not Christ-like toward other people. And that includes mm -hmm. people that we disagree with. And that disagreement can be huge. And that disagreement can be valid, but if we are treating folks as if they have zero dignity and they are unworthy of being, you know, a child of God, then we have kind of gotten off track. And so my um, encouragement, my nugget is, is that as we are digging in um, and hovering over, you know, this rainstorm of a verse, like Greg said, is to just begin to examine your life, you know, and, and see where are the ways in which maybe you have slipped into a little bit of deception as it go as in regards to watering, watering ourselves down, and not saturating ourselves um, in the message of of keeping and committing to being Christ-like. And yeah. so I think revelation should bring hope because we know that throughout the tumultuous trouble, sometimes that there is victory. And, and so we know that. And, and as we look at that in our lives today, the situations that we go through, the things that are happening in our world, the troubling, troubling things are occurring, but there is hope. And the hope is to keep that focus on Jesus and try to be more and more Christ-like in a world that is not um, doing that. And not because of actions, but just because of the way in which we are treating other people. So yeah. that, that's where I am right now with this and that is my nugget for this uh yeah. portion of the series in this mm. conversation yeah that's great um i think uh thanks for going first by the way because i had no idea what i was going to say so uh <laughs> but you know I, I i just to play on this uh relationship piece um i i i just remembered this as you were talking one of my favorite encounters in the old testament is when jonathan confronts uh david about Bathsheba, and 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 David was totally self-deceived and he was totally deceived about the nature of his sin. And, 
only because he knew David so well was he able to share this story of the shepherd. And he knew that David was a shepherd boy and he knew how much he cared about his sheep when he was a shepherd boy. And, and the fact that he used that story as a way to help expose David to that he'd been deceived uh, is just a, such a great example of how um uh, and in fact, I, I need to share this with Greg because this is just a, a really great uh, a, a biblical example of this. But because he knew David so well, he was able to share that story uh, as to expose this self-deception. And it, there, I can't think of a more shocking way. And, and maybe next time I'll actually read that and share that because um, it's such a great example. But the the, the nugget in that is to uh, build spiritual friends have spiritual friends because uh that's that's how that's the best way to help with self-deception and um is to, to get people to you have to allow yourself to be known at the level that david allowed himself to be known um and then you have to be open to hearing what other people say about your life and 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 you need to have safe relationships where that can happen you can't you know it, it's dangerous to share too much about yourself on social media because that's the wolves are there, you know, but if you have a relationship with a real person and it's a real relationship, that's where you can allow yourself to be known. And, um, and people can, can speak into your life in a way that I think can be very liberating. Uh, and, and we see, we see David's life as a great example of that. So I guess that would be my nugget. I love it. I love it. And I'm going to do a musecast. No, no, I'm just going to tag on to your nugget really quickly and say being known is so huge and listening to those in our life. And, and it goes back to what you said last week about when you love someone, you listen, you, you, you listen. hear what they're saying. And so you can't do that again in isolation. You need to be yeah. known by others and you need to know others. And I think that's huge. So that's right. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, folks. It's good <laughs> stuff. <laughs> don't, no, don't don't smoke it. Put no. It, hold on a second here. No, don't put it in your pipe and smoke it. Put it in your heart and live it. That's oh, what you oh, should yeah. be doing. <laughs> is, okay, you're fine. on the wrong show. Here, you, this is the wrong show for what you're what you're selling here. Okay, but you're right. whichever speaks to you, dude. No, I'm kidding. Yes, put it in your heart and live it out. That's right. That's the way we do it. Uh, All right, Dan, that's it for us today. <laughs> we gotta get out of here. Yeah, we gotta get out of here. It's uh, I think it's the weather. It's the weather. It's messing with me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for tuning in guys thanks for sending in your questions musecast at whchurch.org somewhere on your screen and we will see you in the chat later on on youtube have a great rest of your week